Hello and welcome to the latest edition of the Chopping Block Podcast. My name is Paddy Stapleton and every week I sit down with a different guest for a chat about food. Some of my guests make their living within the food and drinks trade, while some just love food. I chat to someone new every week exploring a little bit of their lives through food. Some of my guests you may have heard of before, some you definitely won't know, but unites all these people and the stories they have to tell about the role food and drinks play in their lives. So sit back, put your feet up, pour yourself a glass of Dingle Single Malt Whiskey and enjoy this episode of The Chopping Block. I first got to know this week's guest when he worked at the Celtic Whiskey Shop, where he would advise me on how best to spend my hard-earned money, and also he gave me the odd discount. He now works as the Irish brand ambassador for both the Porterhouse Brewing Company and Dingle Distillery, and has become one of the most recognisable hairy faces in the Irish craft drink scene. On top of that, he's also a farmer of so many generations he can't even remember how many, breeding pedigree Simmental and Angus cattle on his family farm Squeebogue in County Longford. Dave Cummins, also known as Dingle Dave or Beardy Dave, welcome to the pod and thank you for sitting down with me. Pleasure, pleasure to be on. So we'll start with 20 either or questions just to help us learn a little bit about you, interpret them any way you want, we can fly through them, we can take our time and chat. Hopefully by the end we'll have a little flavour of what your tastes are. So big one to start, ribeye on the bone or T-bone steak? Genie Mac. Um, <laughs> ribeye. Okay, single malt or single pot still? Oh, single pot. <laughs> good, good. Half duck or breast of duck? Probably breast of duck. Fruit scone or plain scone? Fruit. Knife and fork or use your fingers? Bit of both. <laughs> you have to pick one or the other. Them's the rules. Um, knife and fork. Beans or no beans? Beans. Five second rule or straight into the bin? Five second rule. Gin goblet or a fancy rocks glass? Fancy rocks glass. Mars bar or Snickers? Snickers. Medium well or medium rare? Medium rare. Dinner with friends or dinner with family? Oh, that's a mean one. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, family. <laughs> Single, single malt batch, one or two or three or four or five? It was three until five came out. So five now? Yeah. Very good. Peaches or plums? Ooh, probably plums. Christmas turkey or Christmas ham? Ham. Bourbon or scotch? Bourbon. <laughs> Wings or ribs? Ribs. Pizza with pineapple or pizza without pineapple? Pineapple. It's fine. Snack box or quarter pounder? They're my two favorite things to order on the takeaway. Um, quarter pounder, with cheese. Michael Cowman or Matt Healy? Oh! I have to go for Cowman because of his surname. Okay. <laughs> a good answer and a good way out. And then last one, is it Jaffa cake, a cake, or is it a biscuit? Oh, it's a total eclipse. Um, it is... <laughs> It's cake. Yeah. Cake, okay. Yeah. Very good. I'm going to go back to a couple of them. So I said bourbon or scotch, and you said bourbon. Yeah. I'm guessing I just think it's one of those things that people just overlook way too quickly. And would the uh, master distiller in Dingle agree with this? Oh, I'd say it just so annoying as well. <laughs> the master like, distiller in Dingle is a scotchman for anybody listening. Okay, so usually we start talking about food, but because it's yourself, we're going to talk about drink. So you work for two of the coolest and most sought after brands out there, Dingle Distillery and Porterhouse Brewing Company. We'll start with the whiskey because that's my, my bigger love. So how did you get into whiskey? You worked in the Celtic Whiskey Shop. Yeah, well, pre before that, it was probably just the bar trade. So I ran bars, restaurants, hotels, nightclubs, and off licenses for good 20 years. Wow. So yeah, since I was like 17 or 18, I worked behind the bar weekends and stuff. Um, for family friends actually who needed the help, they had taken a bar near the near in Athlone actually near, beside us, like half an hour from us. Um, they were just family friends and just needed somebody to come in. And then other friends owned bars in Mullingar and they needed a bit. And it was just kind of like you know jumping in behind the bar whenever things were needed. And then it just escalated from that to running the student union bars in Minute and DCU. And then that company owned five or six other places and hotels. So I ended up being general manager for them for about eight years and then ended up working for 
um, FXBs for another eight years, renovating and doing up their places, especially the Bull and Castle. Was it a big step to leave it? Yeah, well, like I kind of made a decision when I reached, I was either going to put money into a bar or get out of, of the bar trade. Mm. It was kind of like, back when I started, you could easily start a bar for 30, 40 grand. Uh, but now you're looking at the cuts of a quarter of a million or that before you can even, you know, what, before you can even walk in the door. And would so, you be looking um, at Dublin? Yeah. Like, I was only chatting to one of the publicans there earlier on today, and I was saying, like, when I started working in the bar trade, there was about 11,500, 12,000 licenses in Ireland. And when I finished six years ago, five, six years ago, there was 7,500 licenses. That's a much to go down. And I can honestly say they'll probably go down to four or three and a half in the next couple of years. It's you know? way. Yeah. Like I was even I was chatting to Evan, one of our guys that used that worked for us in Spain and that but he, he with the IBEC program and he came back and I was like he was saying one of the guys that he knew from the bar from the let's say the beer side scene in Ireland, he had literally moved from working for a beer company to working for a coffee company and a coffee shop. And I says, They are the new bars of Ireland. I was like, you look at them, I was like, people don't meet in bars in the morning or the daytime for meetings like they used to. It's now meeting in a coffee shop, you know? So, um, yeah, I just think pubs, it's, it's going to be tricky. I think you have to kind of, you have to cover so many bases. I think you have to have food. You have to have an outdoor area that you can incorporate into the bar. You know, you can't be just... The day of just being a pub pub is gone. Not unless you're plonked right in the middle of a high density population. You know, you just, it's too tricky. Too tricky. So you dodged yeah. the bullet, really? Yeah. Yeah. Like I had mates who wanted me to go in. I still have people asking me to go back and because I was very good at making people a lot of money. <laughs> Except <laughs> myself. <laughs> like some of, the, some of the companies I work for, I doubled their profits year on year. Like, and that was with them even taking out the cost for renovations and stuff. And I was just like, why am I not making this for myself? Yeah. <laughs> but, so, uh, so what was the kick that made you leave? I just had a rule. When I started, when I was, not, when I started when I was a, like a teenager, and when I started being more serious, when I was in college in Minute, um, I was like, right, I had a look around and I saw fellas that worked in the bars. And they either go one or two ways. They either like, are really good and not strict, but they just run a bar right and it doesn't affect their health, or else you see the other side of the coin. <laughs> the older guys who are like like a stick, they look like they've lost all their hair, they look like high blood pressure, they're stressed to the nines, they're fighting for every penny. And I was just like, I don't want to be, you know, and just because of the way, like, as, as the years went on, I just saw more and more of that kind of thing, and I was kind of like, you know, like even in the Bull and Castle, like there was a few pubs around the area, like, you know, owners that were literally had pubs for three generations and they literally like were working seven days a week and there were 70 or 80 odd and they were just, they literally like, not like, not being morbid or anything, but they literally die behind the counter. Like. Did Ali come knocking or did you go looking to Ali or? I actually did, uh, I did one of the first kind of dinner nights with Teeling. So Teeling were, because I ran the Bowling Castle, Teeling was down the road for me. And I know Stephen and Jack and the lads for a good long time. And I used to bring my staff once a month to different places to train them on different things. So like I'd bring them to a brewery or I'd bring them to a pub, like we'd organize a staff day. And, or else we'd get someone in to do wine training or, and on different, so it was always kind of like, the way I always thought was, like if you're standing still, you're going backwards. So you always mm. have to, and because our bar was a craft bar, we didn't have any like of the, let's say the large brands at all. It was all, and we had all our beers and our cocktails and our spirits paired with food. So it's very much, you had to know what you were selling and be able to sell it to somebody that has never seen it before or tasted it before. So um, yeah, no, I just, I, I was working with, um, you probably know Mick Reddy and then Kean that worked for Teelings. Yeah, we organised this dinner night and a few of the lads from Celtic came up. It was like we paired three courses. Kev Hurley actually did a cocktail on arrival, and then we did three courses with three different of the Teelings. And and I was chatting with the lads, and then the lads kind of went back to Ali, and then Ali was like to me, "Oh, if ever you're looking for a job, blah blah blah." And I says, "Well, at the minute I'm okay, but then." Um, about I'd say oh six months or nine months later I was fin I decided right I'm either staying in or getting out so I wanted to just take a break 
So he worked in the airport for a little bit, and then he came and asked me. Um, he actually asked me first to go and run his bar down in Clarny, if I go down and have a go at that. And I says, look, I have a farm at home. It's just a bit too far. Yeah. Um, and my dad was getting a bit is getting a bit older, so I was like, I don't want, really want to be that far away, especially if I'm going to start expanding the farm. It's something I can't, like, I'll be four hours away, whereas if I'm in Dublin, I'm only an hour, an hour and a half. Like. Mm. Then we ended up meeting again a month later, and he asked me if I'd come work in the shop, and that was it. So, yeah, second time trying went. Very good. <laughs> one of the, I think one of the reasons why Ali kind of, we chatted a good bit was because um, with the Bull and Castle, we were all, I used, it was literally all independent beers, breweries, and liter- all my spirits. Like I had, I actually had dingle gin porn and vodka porn mm. as in like in most of the cocktails. I had tealing porn in my old fashions and whiskey sours and I had any of the new Irish companies that literally get them in, do a kind of a, like a taste night or, a, you know, just where they could literally set up a table and let people try stuff and pair it with cheese and pair it with meat and, you know, different things like that. And when you were yeah. in the whiskey shop, in the Celtic whiskey shop, uh, it was good fun. There was a good gang in there. Yeah, yeah. Like, I knew a lot of them lads for a long time. Like, you just knew them from the bar trade as well. Like, you mm. know, if you were around, because, like, you'd go out after work and you'd meet people from, like, bar people in in each town meet up in one pub or one place and they go to a beer garden. They generally go to somewhere that's open late but is, has a quiet spot where they can chat because they don't want to be in with I know. madness. And always on a Monday or a Tuesday. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> And tell me, when did Dingle come calling, or Porterhouse? Like, when I worked in the Bowling Castle, that was back in, what, geez, probably 2006, seven, seven or eight, I think. Um, I literally knew Barry since then. So I've known Barry. Barry's been with Dingle and Porterhouse since, the, since well before that. He worked in the, in the sales industry on the cigarette side of things, and then he moved in with the guy. So I've knew, I knew the lads for years. Plus... With us in the Bulling Castle, we were the only craft beer bar apart from Porterhouse. So we used to send people who would always like, people who were into that thing were like going, oh, where can I go that has other kind of interesting beers? And we'd send them, I'd send them down to Gina and Alan down in the Porterhouse in Temple Bar. And I'd go, go down there. That's the only other pub because that was the only other pub at that time. And then um, it was literally just a case of, he was just a mate. I always kept chatting to him. I always kept... And I was finishing up in the Celtic whiskey shop because there was a good few of us going and we were all just kind of looking at different things because we were just, it was just kind of time, like it was a group of us and we were all just kind of finishing up and we were all kind of going different directions. So I was actually going to take a month or so off and go down home, do a bit of work for my dad and stuff like that. And I literally went, one of my mates who ran a pub Text me and says, oh, if you're finishing work, come down to Porterhouse Central. There's some beer launch on. Um, I'm out the back. Um, lo and behold, it was a Porterhouse beer and bumped into the lads, bumped into Barry. And and he was just chatting. We were just chatting. And he was like, oh, what's crack? And I says, oh, I've pretty much handed him a notice and finished up the Celtic. I'm going to do a bit a month's work with the old lad and then I'll probably see. And because um, my folks would always be like, oh, geez, you know, you, you need to, ha- you know, they're a real old, <laughs> you need to have a job. But yeah, I literally just chatting to Barry and I, I was like, oh, I'm finishing up in Celtic, handed in the notice, yada, yada, yada. I'm going to be finishing in a couple of weeks, um, uh, handed in the notice there at the weekend. And Barry was like, what? Oh, what? And I was like, ah, oh, just a bunch of us, we're all kind of moving on. It's time for a bit of a change and stuff like that. And he says, well, we're looking for somebody. Come in and have a chat with us next week. <laughs> And that was that. And you started. <laughs> yeah. I literally went into the interview and it was Barry and Elliot. And I knew Elliot just from seeing at different things, but I never really chatted to him. But like I knew, I know Barry for 20 years and Elliot was asking me questions and he turned around to Barry in the interview and he goes, do you want to ask Dave any, any questions? And Barry's like, there's nothing I don't know about him. So <laughs> and I was just like, sorry, sorry. We just know each other too long. So they were delighted. Yeah, I was delighted too because it was like, I've known them for since I ran pubs in Dublin. Like, I've known them. Um, Did they own Dingle Porterhouse as a separate entity? Is it the same entity? They actually own. So there's Dingle Distillery, there's Porterhouse Brewery, then there's the Porterhouse Bars, then there's the Porterhouse Tapas Restaurants. I love the Porterhouse Tapas Restaurants. Yeah, so that's them four. And then I think they part. There's a part or shared partnership 
with Grand Crew Beers as well, one of our distributors, the beer side of things. They want, I think, the, I don't know the full details, but I think the lads own a certain, are, are part owner, part owners with uh, Wally on that. So did I get your title right? Are you the Ding, the Dingle Distillery and the Portage Brewing Company brand ambassador? Yeah. So I look after the brewery and the distillery and anything to do with the brewery and the distillery. So the bars, let's say the bar, the Porterhouse bars would be like an account of mine and the tapas restaurants would be like an account of mine. Okay. Well, yeah. So yeah, it's a bit tricky because people are always like, oh, you're, it's the same thing. And I'm like, it is and it isn't. And it isn't they're, yeah. separate, they're separate companies. They're run like the brewery and the distillery look after Ireland and the rest of the world, whereas the bars and the tapas restaurants look after, you know, just their certain crap, you know, kind of thing. And working for Dingle Distillery, I mean, for me, I've, got, I've holiday in Dingle every year since I was a baby. Dingle has a very special yeah. place in my heart. Mm. And me loving Irish whiskey, I was delighted when Dingle opened the distillery. And yeah. as the first new distillery to release their own whiskey in 30 years, is it as cool to be working for it as I would assume it is? <laughs> it is. And then there's also when it, like, like sometimes I'll go down, like if I have to go down to Dingle, I'll generally go down a day early so that I can literally just rock up to the distillery. If the lads and the girls are doing something, I'd be like, do you want a hand? And just jump in and kind of have the chats, have a bit of crack with them and just do bits and bobs with them. You know, if I can empty it out the mash, yeah. you know, or oh, what's on the bottle in line today or, you know, just go around and chat and have a bit of crack. And, you know, because there, when you're there, then you realize that it's actually shift work. Oh, I've, like, I've done the tour a, a few times yeah. now and what I love about it is you walk in and there's no bells and whistles it's exactly what you see it's a work yeah. distillery and you walk around it. Yeah. you're not going to be dazzled with any big video coming. screens or anything yeah. like that yeah yeah it's like literally like get out of the way the forklift's coming in or you've got like middle of the tour the, the reverse beeping of the forklift yeah. is going or somebody drops a case and it's like oh crap and you're well <laughs> shite and uh, you know you can't there's no there's no uh, sensor in any of that, yeah. Even, it even the, the shop. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's a little porter yeah. cabin shop. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. How long were you with them? Had they released their own whiskey by the time you were with them? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm yeah. with them three years now, I think. This is a good time to get you because not only is the new single pot still being released next week. Yeah, the fifth. The fifth. Yeah. You also have the new Descendants cask program, which I think is launched tonight. Literally launched 40, 42 minutes ago. So I'm very grateful for your visit now because I'm sure your phone is blasting yeah. away in the corner. What is the Descendants program? Um, so back in the summer, we were doing a thing in between the restrictions. We had a, a bit of a, a tour thing for the aviators where we split them down. And we were talking earlier on in the year about, oh, would we do a cast program? Would we, wouldn't we? And myself and Graham were chatting. And Graham was kind of like just airing a few concerns. He, like he... In Scotland, they're pretty regular. And I was like, well, here, like, we were one of the one, like, Middleton and a few of the rest of them, the bigger guys before us, did do them, obviously. But they're so big, it's like, you're looking at serious numbers. I was going to say, the prices and, are big as well. Yeah, yeah. It was kind of, it was nearly in a way, it was the first time it was kind of done in, in a small way. And it was like, so the lads kind of learned as they went along. So there was a few hiccups. So, so this was, was a, this was the founding yeah. fathers. Founding Fathers, yeah. So, so the Founding Fathers, of, sorry, just for anybody who doesn't know, was a cask. You could buy your own cask. It was before the, the whiskey was distilled. And it was a way to kind of finance the... Yeah, it was the, like it was a, uh, crowdfunding. Pretty yeah. much crowdfunding. But the thing was, like, I was chatting to Peter and Liam about this. And uh, Liam was like to me, sure, like, myself and Oliver, we were chatting in the pub, in the Porterhouse pub one evening. And Oliver was like, do you know what, I'm going to... We're going to sell cast. We're going to sell cast to a certain number of people, and this will give us a bit of revenue to get things going, so that we can still make the gin, vodka, and the whiskey. Yeah. And Liam was like, "Oh, this is a great idea." And then he says, "The following morning, Oliver rings him and goes, How many casts have you sold?'" And Liam was like, "What are you talking about?" And, uh, and Liam goes, "What are you talking about?" And Oliver goes, "Sure, I sold twenty or thirty. He's like, "We were only talking about it. It wasn't actually you know." And that was just kind of like, I was just like, oh my God, what do you like? You need and, that uh, madness though. Oh yeah. yeah. So yeah, The Descendants is pretty much, it's nearly a copy of The Founding Fathers, which was 500, only this time it's 100. Yeah. And there is a few more terms and conditions. So literally once the 100 is sold out, they're sold out. Yeah. The idea is we'll offer, this year we're offering single malt in four different cast types. Next year... It might be every year or every 18 months. The lads haven't decided just yet. Um, next year, it could be single pot still, which, let's say, 
completely different cast like Madeira or Cognac or something. And then the year after it could be Peated, it could be Rye. So the idea is that it gives people different options each year. And if they want to get involved and have their own whiskey, it's a great way of kind of, you know, because you always have them kind of conversations. Well, not now with COVID, but you used to have those kind of conversations in the pub. Be like, oh, Jesus, what would, what kind of whiskey would you have if you, yeah. if you have your own whiskey? You know, I've that had kind that of conversation many times. Yeah. <laughs> and tell well, me, like, um, is it is it geared towards corporations, groups, people, whiskey everybody. societies? Everybody. So I literally, for me, before it launched, I kind of just gave a few of the people in the industry and a few of the whiskey bars are kind of a heads up saying look this is coming yeah and um, <laughs> just if you just want to have you know have a look at it so there's literally options where it can either be a single person purchase or a group so the group yeah. can be as few as two it can be as many as a hundred or whatever but it's a it's a cool thing to be able to do i mean i'm one of my big regrets is when the founding fathers came out that i didn't get involved but at the time i was buying a house so your yeah. timing was terrible. <laughs> <laughs> and at this stage, I sent around a message last week asking a few fellas would they be interested. And yeah. it was a bit wishy-washy. But uh, yeah. when, when the pot still pops through in 12 or 18 months, I'll be... I'll be yeah. I, I'll, the, have, I'll have them the all big, forewarned. Now that it's... Yeah, now this is the first one. So yeah. now it's like, we'll see what the... Rese- and the whole idea of having a limited amount as well just makes it a little bit more appealing as well mm-hmm. for people. But then it also... It, it sticks in your head for next year or, or 18 months online when we do the next one if it's something different that you know takes your fancy then you can kind of gear yourself towards it you know yeah we're pre-warned yeah. and tell me with the new pot still coming out next week would I be right in saying this is the first pot still cask strength that you guys have it done it is and, and I'm bottles. working on having the very first pot still bottle number one auction for charity as well excellent brilliant yeah because it's the first cask strength pot still we've ever released publicly from the distillery I think you know, we should do something special with it. And I had a chat with Anthony and Katie in Irish Whiskey Auctions. Yeah. And I was like, look, I'd love, because I mentioned it to them back a while ago. I had it in my head and I was like to them, what do you think? And they were like, listen, we're game if you can sort it. And I says, leave it with me. I'm really good at annoying people. <laughs> and they were like, <laughs> so, but the lads are cool. Like literally anything, like it's great. Like everyone always kind of laughs at me when they ring me to go oh i'm looking to do this what do you think and i says give me two minutes and they're like what do you mean, give me two minutes and i was like well there's literally only like three or four of us and you know we just have it. There are, there are, there's no board yeah. to run it by and tell me with the single pot or sorry yeah with the single pot still coming through the cast train how many people have texted you asking you to keep a bottle oh loads yeah. but like they've got, like even last year even with the single malt ones this year and last year people are like oh where can i get and i'm like I've told you a million times, your local independent or anyone that normally gets it, it's an allocation, everybody, and they're like, oh, but they don't, they said they didn't get it. And I'm like, they got it. They, got they just it, have yeah. to put it on the shelf, you know? I was like, I can't do anything about that kind of thing, you know? And when you see on auction sites and, and you see the dingle, like this cast strength one, whatever yeah. it's going to cost, within the minute it's sold out, it's going to maybe double in price. Does that annoy yeah. you guys? Does it add value to the brand? A bit of both. Like yeah. we had we had talks about before and we were like, should we start advertising the like when we do posts on social media or the odd time somebody chats to us to do a newspaper piece, should we put a RRP price? Which we ge- generally do or yeah. if anyone else we do. You can only it's it is what it actually states. It's a recommended retail price. You can't actually like go in and chastise a shop for you know like I get text messages off somebody going oh I was in Dublin and one street and uh, is this price and then two hundred yards down the road it's it's forty quid dearer and I'm like I literally can't do anything about it. I yeah. literally I tell them what the recommended retail price is, but that's theirs. But it was you extraordinary. Know? The first cast strength single malt, I bought a yeah. bottle for I think it was one hundred and twenty five quid. Yeah, one hundred and twenty five would have been. Yeah. Within two years, they were going online for fourteen, fifteen hundred euro. Yeah, yeah. Which was bananas. Yeah, but you're seeing the exact same thing happen with water water whiskey yeah. at the minute. And it's like up around 900. And like, realistically, it's going to fall back to about 350, 400. But does it annoy you guys that the whiskey's not been drank? Well, you know me. Whenever I do a taste and I'm like, open the goddamn box. Yeah. You know, just get, find the goods, like find a thing that you want to celebrate with friends or family and open it, yeah. you know? But like, 
you will you will have people who collect. But another thing I I've said before to people is like when I worked in Celtic whiskey shop, I remember a brother and sister came in and they had their father's funeral the week before, and they were walking around the shop and they looked up and they saw a Middleton nineteen eighty five I think it was or an eighty nine, and they were like, and I just saw the sister slap the brother on the shoulder and I was like, yeah, right there, and she was like. We were making Irish coffees with that whiskey last week at my father's wake. <laughs> and I was just like, and she was looking at the price and the brother was like, oh my, and they were going mad. And I was like, I was like, relax, relax. I was like, did you enjoy it? Did you enjoy it? Yeah. And they were like, yeah, we had great crack in the kitchen. And I said, well then, feck it, it doesn't matter. Yeah. You know, I was like, but that's what happens. I've seen, so, especially when I was working in Celtic, I've seen so many people coming in and they were like, oh, my wife says I can't keep as many and they literally just said, or else my father used to, my father-in-law used to have this he died we're clearing out the house <laughs> give me some money for this and I'm gone take the whole lot and that's it right. like and that's why I'd be worried that's why I said I was actually ch- chatting to Paul from Belfast Whiskey Week and I was like going the amount of people that are going to you know keep collections and have them locked away and for never nothing. do anything yeah. yeah and you're just kind of like Either sell them and there was one woman that was brilliant. Her husband said to her, I'm going to die before you. Whenever I die, open that press, bring it into the Celtic whiskey shop and sell it and go on a cruise. And she came up like two or three weeks later. We had the money ready for her. There you go. And she was like, I was like, what are you going to do now? Go and book on a cruise. And I was like, that's what that's, that's that's it, yeah. And like she was, she was there with her, with like two, with one walking stick. And I was like, it was. I was like, <laughs> no good to her. Yeah. Do you have a collection yourself? I have a go. I have a few bits like stuff that kind of I like, stuff that kind of what else? Stuff that people in the industry through different things have given me for doing different things. Mm. So, um, yeah, some really kind of weird and interesting ones that yeah, that literally like <laughs> like one is new make spirit from the still for the first time ever run off in. A certain city in Ireland um, <laughs> and it was just because of something I did done for them and you know worked with them um, to back in the day uh, in, and they literally gave it to me it's literally in just a handwritten note around the bottle it's like an old nagon just and that's it and they're that's like it. you know don't don't ever uh, if, if a tax man comes you didn't get you don't have it yeah <laughs> we you better know? move on from the whiskey much as we could sit here all night talking about whiskey yeah. Um, the Porter House so yeah. came along, pretty much started the whole craft beer revolution. Yeah. Is definitely. it still going as strong? It is and it isn't. It's a very tricky market. Um, for me, the beer side of things was literally the first thing I got into, like the, on the bar side of things. Yeah. It was, it was the beer side, the craft beer side and the independent beers that actually brought me to the independent spirits. So like... Um, like for me, it's a very important thing because it's same with the spirits and that. It's like it's the whole sport and local. Like it creates local jobs. It's like it's there's no chemicals, there's no you know preservatives. And like yeah, the lads were trailblazers. Like I remember when they opened and people were like having bets on how quick it would be before they closed. Yeah, like, I remember reading about it. Yeah, how quick it would be before they take Guinness on in and stuff. And then I used to love just the he used to break me break my whole laugh and at the different labels and badges they bring out yeah. and I was like like the wiser buddy and all this kind of stuff and you know different things like that and I remember I was chatting to Liam about it and Liam was like he was like because Oliver was a trained solicitor and they'd get like one letter of like stop and desist or whatever from you know certain companies and Oliver was like ah it's only one letter we wait until we get three or four more <laughs> and Liam would be like he Liam was like I'd be fucking shit in a break <laughs> And he was like, ah, it'd be grand, it'd be grand. It'd be grand. So and even like, though he was a trained solicitor, it was quite kind of bohemian, right off the cuff. Oh, yeah, yeah. It was kind of like Oliver would come up with crazy ideas and then Liam would try and find out how he would actually make it work money-wise and back and, like, being able to physically make it work, yeah. you know? So they were a really good combination, like, that kind of way. The lads were always pushing at doing different things and then it was always a case of, like, they had the brewery in Temple Bar, they outgrew it, then they moved out to outside Blanche and uh, nearly a national aquatic centre. They outgrew that, but they couldn't move because they were doing different things between the bars, the restaurants, the distillery, 
it was very tricky. And then there, uh, two years ago, I moved to the new one there uh, beside Glass and Evans Cemetery. Yeah. And um, it's much bigger, but it's just a case of between all the moving and the shaking and stuff like that, it kind of interfered with us pushing the brand, let's say, nationally, let's say, off licenses and stuff like that. The bars always had to, you know, they, they had to have beer to sell. Yeah. So they were, you know, you had to look after them first. Whereas now we have the capability to go further because new state of the art brewery. So we can literally push it now across, you know, all your independence, all your super values, your centrals. The off trade exploded. Like I was going to say, my friends explodes. and O'Brien's, and they yeah. did the equal of three Christmases over COVID. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, like some of the shops were doing 250% their normal monthly. Crazy. Um, were you seeing that in the bottles and cans? Yeah. Well, like literally when COVID hit, we had lorries of kegs coming back from the likes of Italy, Russia and stuff like that. They couldn't go. They weren't allowed to cross. They had to come back. So we had tanks of beer. Like, I mean, hectically, like thousands. Yeah. And we were sitting in the office in the brewery and we we're like, what are we going to do? And I was like, well, it can either go practically down the drain or to animal feed or we can actually put it into bottles and cans and try and do something with it. So I was like, we're not going to make any major money on it. We can, like, we'll make money, but we'll do some deals because they all, the, everyone's in a bit of a tricky situation. So let's, yeah. do some, let's do something for the first month and see what happens. So we did, I, did deals, um, I did deals for the first month and literally like a, lorry came, like a distributor came and took four or five pallets. We had about, I'd say we did five pallets of each beer so we had the guts of 30 or 35 pallets of beer and I'd say about 30 pallets of beer and the came and took four or five the first week and then within <laughs> 10 days it was all gone, gone. and that- I was like, look we did the deal that deal and we couldn't do that again it was literally just like we were just covering ourselves but we were just like look it's a really dodgy situation I would prefer people to have our beer in their hand than not yeah, and then I myself and Barry sat down and we just literally did deals each month to see what was best for our accounts and our product and the consumer, where it kind of balanced. Yeah. Because you have, if you're not making money, you can't make the products. You know, you can't make the beer, you can't make the gin or the vodka because you can't cover the pay the staff. You know that kind of way. And as you so say, we, it's it's no good going down the drain. Exactly. Yeah. So we just tested out different offers that we could do, and then we kind of fine tuned it. You know. And then I had contingencies ready for this lockdown from the last one. So I was yeah, I think it. everyone learned what they needed to do. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And tell me if you're if you're taking a night off, you're not drinking drinking Dingle or you're not drinking Porterhouse beer. Favorite yeah. pubs in Dublin? Or in I go, I go into the pubs that there's no music, no TVs, and it's just people talking. So, so Palace I, Bar, Palace Bar, Long Hall, Grogan's, you know. Even if I'm going to have meetings or meeting up with friends during the day, even if it's just for a coffee, yeah. you know, that's, they're the kind of places I go. I kind of like, because my mind is always going. I prefer the pubs where there's the noise of people talking and it's kind of like, it just, it's like, it's like what I used to do every Sunday when I worked in the bar game. I took Sundays off because nobody could ring me on a Sunday. So I took Sundays off. Yeah. And I hit the coast on the Sunday. So that's what I did. Literally walked up here or watched, and literally in the worst weather ever, I'd still do it. And the way it was, it was just because the, the noise of it clearing your head out after all that, you know, customers roaring at you or even at Christmas time playing last Christmas every night for 40 oh. nights, you know. <laughs> Fairy <laughs> tale like in New York. I think I'm the only person in the world who hates that yeah. song. I hit it with a passion. I hit it with a passion. If I hear it on the radio, I'll smash the thing. Or the Mariah Carey one. I don't know if because it was oh, you, yeah. but the place goes mad. Have you not yeah. heard this 700 yeah. times already tonight? So, like, whenever I'm in a pub, I same kind of thing. I just like the pub where it's literally just the atmosphere, the noise of people chatting is the thing that just, and it just kind of. Okay. And what's, yeah. your, what's your order? It depends, actually, seasonally. It's seasonally kind of, I think that's more, that's actually from the craft beer kind of things yeah. because like I was very big on seasonality in the, in the taps I had in the bar. So like in the autumn time, like now it would be reds and red IPAs pushing into stouts yeah. and, and um, amber beers and kind of caramel malts and stuff like that. And then in the spring and summer, it's kind of lagers, IPAs kind of, you know, different. So it's always kind of like, um, 
and my mates would be the same. We'd kind of generally go to places, like if it wasn't like some of them places, we'd try and see what independent beer they'd on and try it, you know? Oh, yeah. yeah, and just try something different. You but know? Say, say you go into a bar with no craft, like you'd be fairly well known around, you know a lot of the publicans. You order yeah. a pint of Guinness, so you're sitting there going, who's looking at me? No, you don't give a no. shit. <laughs> no. I, I wouldn't order, I'd never order a pint of Guinness. <laughs> what would you order? Would you order a Heineken or a Smithix or a... No, like, I'd probably... Don't worry, I'll probably, cu- I'll probably cut this out. <laughs> I'd probably have a coffee, to be honest with you. <laughs> Good no, answer. Be like, more of the places would have one or two. And if I see one, I'd be like, right, we're getting that. You know, because for me, it's kind of like, I know how those people feel, or I know how those people work, or what they're trying to do. So, you know, because most of them, like Grogan's would have, Grogan's would have two or three taps, actually, two taps. Yeah. Long Hall would have two or three. Palace Bar have two or three, you know. Actually, Willie was actually on to me. He was like, "You ever do a non-alcoholic beer for me?" And I was like, "Oh, I'll see, I'll see." And the lads were like, "Oh my God, how the hell am I going to do this? Give me two minutes." <laughs> yeah, and I said to the lads, and they were like, "Oh my God!" Oh. And they're like, "Okay," and I was like, "Well, it has to, have to be really full flavored." And they were like, "Oh, you're really wrecking our heads." <laughs> I'm like, That's "I don't care." It's going. It's like, and tell me, working as a rep between the whiskey and the beer, are you not more used to now watching other people drink than drinking yourself? Yeah. Yeah. Like this, I actually had a conversation with one of the brand ambassadors. Who was it? It wasn't Cowman, it was somebody else. It was a Matt, or no, it might have been Dottie O'Connell actually. Um, and we were just saying, like, everyone thinks, like, oh, you're like, oh, you're doing a tasting this night, or you're doing an event that night. Oh, you must be going on the, you know, yeah, Raz for the night, or you must be heading out. And I'm like, no, I have to be at something at nine o'clock in the morning <laughs> at the far end of the country. And I'm not 21 anymore. <laughs> yeah, and I'm just like going, it's going to take me an hour and a half to get back. It's going to take me, you know, or it's going to take me an hour to break this down and throw it in the back of the van, get back home, get back up, then unload the van in the morning and load it up for something else. Or if it's going to a meeting, you're literally running from one place to the next, you know, from one thing to the next. Last thing about drink before we go on to food. Yeah. Uh, Whiskey Live. Yes. So Whiskey Live is my favorite weekend every year. To mm-hmm. me, I look forward to it more than Christmas. And that's not an exaggeration. From the other side, from behind the, the, the counter at Whiskey yeah. Life. So for anybody listening who hasn't been to Whiskey Life, it's basically a massive whiskey event. Uh, it has been in Dublin Castle. It's moving next time it's on. But you basically pay your, your, your entry fee and you walk in and you can taste the best Irish whiskey you can find. Anything you want to find that's available, you're, you can just taste it. Uh, you do have to kind of discipline yourself and figure out what you want to do. It can get messy. But from your point of view... <laughs> That's after the first year where you literally just go around and do it. Yeah, everything. it takes a while to come on that you want yeah. to remember. It. But from your Not point of view, bad. being behind the bar, is it enjoyable? Does it get tiring? Is it get away oh, from me, you drunken idiot? Completely exhausting. Yeah. Like it is. You will be, you will have to take, like we literally, like we do, we're setting up on the Thursday. Then you're pretty much doing it all day Thursday, all day Friday, all day Saturday. If you don't get out of there Saturday night, you have to come back in Sunday to clear out. So it's literally, for a two-day event, you're there for four days. Like. And um, how, how many drunken idiots are there as opposed to people who are into their whiskey? It was worse years ago. It's gotten better now. Mm. So as, you, as you were saying, like people actually now have not strategies, but they've plans when they go in. They're mm. like, I heard this is coming out from this place. I want to try They'll, go, they'll want to try four or five and then they'll literally go and do whatever. If they see something they think is cool, they'll try mm. it. But they'll have four or five different ones that they really want to try and be able to remember what they tried. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, yeah. And Dingle is always fairly high up on the list for people. Yeah, and we don't, we don't spend a lot on, like, because we are who we are. We kind of, you know, some of the bigger lads have huge stands, like, mm. which is fine, but we kind of keep it, you know, there'd literally be one of us or two of us behind the counter. That's it. But like, you, the only things you need is water and then hot Asians. drinks. <laughs> yeah. Hot drinks if you can. Where like any of my friends that come in, I literally say, if you're coming to my stand, bring a coffee or bring a tea yeah. because your voice is the first thing that will go. Because there's so many people, it's so tightly packed. Even if someone is literally only like two foot away from you, you do have to raise your voice. So like after the first session, your voice is starting to, you know, it's starting to go. So you need to kind of keep. So like I'd normally take, uh, let's say, a case of 24 small bottles underneath the counter or like five or six large bottles. And that do me 
pretty much one session like wow you know you just have to keep just keeping your voice and at the, at, 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 wouldn't be able to talk. at the end at the last half an hour of the session on the saturday night yeah is the tempting to just tell people fuck off <laughs> oh well like sometimes you're kind of like uh, like if you feel the session is getting messy you're like right these people are acting the mm. you know there's some of them here that are just literally going round and round. They don't even know where they are now. Yeah. So if you have something that you've kind of special or you're just kind of like, you know, I oh, know I'm going to put that underneath that with a way because you'll spot the person that you know wants it yeah. and that will actually appreciate it. And then you just spot the people that are absolutely belubous just run around the place, you know? Yeah. So, and at, at the end of the weekend, so in my head what happens is when everybody else has gone home drunk, yourself, Cowman, Healy, Michael Carr, Kevin Piggott, who am I forgetting? Gerald Gardland, all these lads. In my head, you all go and you just open up the best of what's left behind. Does that happen? During the sessions, it does. <laughs> really? <laughs> well, I think oh, you'll get away with it because everybody else is so trolly they can't tell. Before, before the thing is starts, or generally in between two of the sessions, or at, like you'll, you'll hear, oh, such and such as this. And I'm like, and someone will walk by, oh, Jarlett has this up above or Lisa remember, has it yeah. down there and you're just like what? I was like what the and you're like fuck you're like oh I have to try that before this you know so then they literally you'd literally throw them a look going and kind of mouth across the way I hear you out and they'd be like one minute and they come over and then I'd be like oh well I have this here you yeah. go you know and you kind of put it underneath the counter and you'd have it in a little tasting cup and like if Barry came back in I'd be like oh this is from you know Eklundville give it a give it a lash there or yeah. a valley camera is like, oh, there's something that's kind of different. Try it. You know, because that's the thing. It's just about, it's the only time we see each other, mm. the brand ambassadors. When we do see each other, yeah, then afterwards we kind of go, right, we're going to this pub or we're going to that pub. And it's generally, it ends up being two or three different pubs and you kind of float between the different pubs, kind of. But try, then, not, then, try not to yeah. stop talking to people from that day who are now absolutely out of it. Oh, yeah, or else some people that, are at the thing that are a little bit how do I say this tapped um, over here where you're meeting and turn up and you're like oh for yeah, <laughs> if, I've like, ever, if I've ever been that person I'm very sorry <laughs> no you're not that person there's some people you know yourself there's some people in the industry and in that have whiskey or different things as a hobby that are just so intense and you're just kind of like relax just drink it and enjoy it <laughs> You know, and you're just like, they start going on and on and on about something. I'm like going, I'm like, do you think you're a droplet of like new make spirit going through a still? I'm like, <laughs> calm down, calm down. We're just, we're actually just chatting about like the rugby or we're chatting about something random. We're not even chatting about that, you know? Right. We better move on from the, from the drink. Let's, let's talk about your farming. So you're a pedigree beef breeder. Yes. Tell me what that is. Um, in I suppose if you've any American viewers, it would be called seed stockman, or it would be literally I breed pedigree bulls to sell to other farms, so that I breed them to try and improve the breed, okay. so that people that buy them will use them across their herd and bring their herd up to being more feed efficient, being more um, their average day, like the weight that they put on they're more efficient with their food to put on more weight or more milk they'll genetically not genetically but just um it's kind of a mixture of everything genetics structure of the animal and stuff trying to get the breed characteristics right um and that's what i do i breed bulls for people to buy to buy and put on their farm to try and pretty much bring their farm up even further like i'm always trying to improve as well so like that's the thing. It's it's like anything. It's like making whiskey. It's like making beer. You make it the first time you're trying, or you do it the first time you're trying to get it better and better the next time. You never mm. really stop, you know. But like we were before that, we were dairy farmers, and we used to do free range hens as well. Um, and my brother actually he breeds um show jumping horses and um draft horses as well. So, geez, so it's yeah. agriculture everywhere. Yeah, so like he has horses, he has about eight horses on the farm. I have about 30 or 40 cattle on the farm. And then I also help out Irish rare breeds as well. Mm. So like for me as a farmer, our responsibility as a farmer is to improve the different breeds that we're in. But it's also to look after the land, leave it better than you found it. That's kind of that's something that's drilled into you from when you're young, really. It's mm. like 
this is the land that I got from my father. It's my job to improve it so that when it goes to the next generation, it's better. You know, it's, you know, it's been looked after, it's healthy, it's, you know. Yeah. And, um, yeah, and same with just, you know, like, like some of the sheds on our farm, my dad built and his dad built before that. And it's just kind of adding on to them without, like, even though my brother has a habit of knocking some. <laughs> but um, I don't knock any. I kind of look at it as a long-term plan and kind of build on to it. Yeah. And then the Irish rare breeds, it's kind of like, again, it's a duty to look after certain animals and certain breeds that, because they're not as commercially viable as they used to be, but it's, it's I kind of see it as a duty that they have to be kept alive and kind of brought on. So I help out like the Irish Moyle Cattle Society and the Drimmon Cattle Society. And then there is also the Kerry Cattle and the, the Dexters, but I haven't been involved in them two just yet. And um, we are involved in another one with the Drimmond. We're involved with the Boreach. They're like a brindle cattle, but okay. they, haven't, they haven't been recognized as an... Because you have to DNA test them to prove that they're an independent breed, like an actual breed separate to another breed. Yeah. So, like, um, yeah. So, like, for me, it's kind of like do what I do, but also give back to the farming community in whatever way I can. Yeah. How many hours do you have in a day? <laughs> <laughs> like I'm getting tired listening to you um, I was doing a bit of research just about the farming because I mean the level you're at I wouldn't know much about it but I saw there recently uh, is it Simmental is that how you pronounce it? Yeah Cemental or Cemental. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm definitely going to edit that one so, <laughs> recently a Cemental bull called oh, yeah. Kana Lucky Explorer sold for 50 yeah, grand. Gold. 52 grand highest, the highest um, bull yeah yeah is that a mental price or is that or is it going up and up the whole time? No, it's a good, it's a good price. Like, um, it's the highest price for, uh, as far as I know, it's the highest price. It is the highest price. It's double the highest price for uh, in Ireland that the record ever was. I think it's the highest price in the UK as well. It went uh, to the UK, didn't it? He went to Pope's, Pope's herd okay. and cogent, um, cogent breeding her, uh, their an AI service. Yeah. I actually bought, I brought bulls over, not bulls, but, their semen over from Pope's actually a couple of years ago. They're a really good herd. Yeah. But like Garrett has invested, Garrett's from Leash, Garrett has invested heavily. Like Garrett, the bull that that bull is out of, Garrett bought in Sterling in October 17 for 22,000 guineas. Wow. So like, and then the year before or 18 months before that, he bought another bull for I think 17 or 18,000 guineas. So Garrett, is, Garrett has a herd of about 100 breeding females. So he has the ability to breed, use the bull, like you generally use a bull across 20 or 25 cows. Um, so you're able, you're able to see what he does. Yeah. Because you will, there's, there's, there's a worldwide database. So I can actually go in and I can look at my Angus and I can compare them to every animal born in that year. I can go in and look at cementals and do the same thing. And I can literally go back through their parentage back to hundreds, like 100 years ago or so. Like horses, uh, like turbid horses. Yeah, exactly the yeah. same. And it's just like we collect data. So I weigh all my calves when they're born. I measure them. I weigh them when they're coming off their mothers, when they're weaning off their mothers. So it's all, it's kind of a mixture of genetics, data. And Garrett is just one of the ones that's really, he's really good at it. And he's invested heavily in it. Um, but and is he making money to that level to, to justify the investment? In a way, in a way, and not like it's it's tricky. Like it's like I hear fifty two grand for a bull. I think well, that's mental. But obviously, the cost involved yeah, is huge. Like put it this way: like he's 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 got a hundred breeding females, so he's got a hundred calves. Then if he's keeping half of the heifers each year, that's fifty. So at any one stage on his farm, he has anything from. 250 to 300 animals and he has to feed them all year round yeah you know and like me feeding let's say my five young bulls that cost me 400 euro for just meal just meal now that they're weaned not including silage would cost me a grant like yeah that's, it adds that's up and it adds five. up and it adds that's up five. like you never it's, it's something my dad my dad and my mom and anybody in the farming community drives all their kids away from the farming community because they're like there is no money you will never make any money in it because <laughs> you will never get a holiday. <laughs> yeah, I, and someone always used to say to me, "It's a lifestyle. It's not a job. It's yeah. like you're never going to make massive amount of money, but like 
even like even now my friends and girlfriend they're kind of like well look you're you're going to spend the money on them anyway even if like i've i've gone like at the start i've gone in a month of just eating cornflakes one time just to make sure i could cover a cost for different animals wow you know? yeah but it's just something you do you kind of like you know you're kind of like no if i do this i can you know i can make sure this is done for them kind of thing yeah like when i was running bars back when i was like 20 something i literally i remember one month i just went on all i literally had conflicts that was it and then staff meal and work that was it <laughs> for the whole month oh man i was sick of conflicts after that <laughs> it's a, it's a, a typical like, irish man look after the cattle yeah. before yourself yeah but that's that's what you that's what you see what happens like it's the same when things go bad it's like you will see certain bad things happen where farmers will actually like and there's a few concerns, same thing's going to happen now because prices aren't the best. Yeah. But farmers will actually commit suicide so that their neighbours or somebody else will get the, the animals in the will and they know they'll look after them instead of them actually just going and asking, you know? Isn't it crazy that that's even a thought? Oh, yeah, but that's the way they are. Like, they could never... Like, my dad even, like, when we all went to college, he kept cattle. He was never making any money on them. But cattle have always been... That bloodline's been on that farm for forever. And he kind of had a feeling that some of us might, you know, so he kept it. So like, It's a part of him. It's, it's like, yeah, it's like, let's say our family are connected to the animals and connected to the land. We're all, we're all part of a circle. That's literally farming. It's a circle. Like yeah. everything is a circle, you know? And like, even though I'm breeding pedigree now, I will still keep the commercial, the mixed breed ones yeah. that he had. I will still keep a few of them on because that's a bloodline that my grandfather saw and his father saw and his father saw. You know, that's been there since forever. And they've been on that land for forever. So, like, I could never not have some of them, you know, yeah. that kind of way. Even though they won't make me anything, I don't care. <laughs> Do you think there's a future there for, like, the small rural farms? Do they have to diversify? I mean, it, it seems to be going the way of the big farm. It has to, you, like, for me, I would look to get to about... I'm going to try, I'm going to 40 cattle breeding females and then I'll probably push to 80 okay. and then I'll see if it's a viable business. But then you have to diversify. So I'm literally looking. So next year I'm hoping I call to a farm very early this year to see about taking my first two Irish miles next year um, to start my herd of Irish miles. And then in the year after I'll try and get two Drimmon. And I'm kind of thinking I might diversify as well, have my beef, but also have the milder or the Drimmon and make cheese. So that's something down the track that I would hopefully look to do. I can introduce you to a cheese farmer. I can, I can hook you up. Uh, yeah, I haven't a clue. Like, I know the process, but I've never done it. But I'm like, going, ah, I'll just give it a go. Um, but yeah. like, Do you raise you the slaughter? No. No, you'd never eat your own beef? Oh, yeah, I have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And would like, you know... Some, go on, sir. Some, some of them you would, like, I had one bull years ago. What was he, three or four years ago? And for sometimes you just get ones that just have this bad temperament. Like we wouldn't be like, I could walk through my cattle and like, even I, I took a video there and I sent it to Danny McGovern there at the weekend of the heifers. Like, mm. and like I, we try and do as minimal contact with them, but because we're so, we generally be calm and relaxed around them. Like they're coming up to me now, you know, even though they were never really, and she was like, I can't believe they're literally like, they're smelling the, your, your camera on the yeah. phone they're right beside you and I was like yeah they're just used to you now they get used to you and that kind of thing but like sometimes you will get one that just has a demeanour that's like I don't like you I'm going to charge you, you. <laughs> yeah and I had one bull and I don't know why he was like that and he literally was like that from when he was like 10 months old you'd walk in to the shed and you're like he started scratching the ground he started making and I'm like sometimes to do it messing you know at the start when they're yeah. young cause it was, they're like teenagers, but he'd make a go for you. And I'm like, I'm like, whoa, no. So like, for me, I, I, I could never sell that on to somebody. Yeah. You know, imagine if that, you sold it on to some farmer and he got pinned by a wall or something. And he killed but, him, yeah. You know, you're kind of like, that's, it's bad karma. Like, you, you just don't do that. You just yeah. don't do that. So sometimes you have to make the choice, like, and it was just out of the blue. And the fella that he was sharing, let's say, the field and the shed when he came in, he was grand. It was just him. He was just, he was just nuts. He'd look at you like he was going to shoot you. And I was like, what is wrong with you? Why are you so angry? So you ended, up, you ended up eating them. Yeah. yeah. And what breed was he? He was an Angus. And did you yeah. notice much of a difference in the flavor of the steak? 
Um, yeah, some of my mates actually try and catch me out with different things sometimes. Like yeah. That. They're like, what's this or what's that? Um, yeah, you would like, there's, there is certain differences, but not as much as people would think I would say sometimes. You'd need like, a fairly educated palate, would you? Yeah, it's the same as blind taste of whiskey. Like, yeah. You know, if you have a bourbon and sherry cast from four different distilleries, like trying to pick out if they're all in around the same age, like if you're blindfolded, not unless yeah. you know what you're tasting and have been tasting it for years, you're going to be like, oh, you'd probably say, oh, A and C are the same ones, even though they're all different. You know, that kind of way. Yeah. And with beef, I suppose it would depend on the cooking of it as well. Exactly. Yeah. Like doing it right. Like that was one thing I, le- I learned and saw seen in FX Buckley. That was the best thing. The lads in the kitchen, like I go down to the kitchen and the lads like sometimes to be cooking something and they literally like taste that. And you were like, what is it? And they're like, not telling you until you taste it. And it was the best thing ever. Yeah, I education. Was, oh, it was brilliant because you were just like, you weren't going into it with any misconceptions or thinking, oh, I don't like that. They'd literally go, not telling you because you couldn't see past them to see what they were cooking. So they yeah. were like, taste it. And I taste it because I love doing that because I was like, you know, I don't know what the hell I'm going to taste, but... And then when they tell you, you're like, oh my God, that's what that tastes like. I never knew that. <laughs> <laughs> and are you a cook yourself? Do you cook? Yeah. When I have the time, I love to cook, but I'm a... <laughs> How do you I'm, have the time? <laughs> yeah. um, but I'm an absolute demon in the kitchen. If someone comes in, because I worked in bars and stuff, and in kitchens, like I'd have the kitchen if they, were, if they were stressed in, like if it was a really busy time, like, you know, just, um, you know, the hatch, you know, like organizing the hatch yeah. for food was up and out and stuff so you have to be very like you know drill sergeant kind of thing where's this and be very loud and shouting and like table this i've got this where's this one how long and you know you just kind (laughs) of and from working in bars and restaurants and especially like steakhouses like the fx bookies it was very kind of like um everything had its place if it wasn't in its place you were like why is that not in it you know yeah be there so like when i'm in a kitchen like i'm like Get out of my way. Get out of my way. We're just going to here. Just leave me alone. Yeah, because I literally look and I'm like, why are you chopping them like that? No, <laughs> no, no. <laughs> it's, like, it's, it's hard to imagine you being a bollocks, Dave, I have to say. Yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and tell me, if you're, you're home alone, like tonight is a miserable, rainy, miserable night. Yeah. You're, you're cooking for yourself. You have a bit of time. What do you treat yourself to? I normally do, like, I love doing dishes that are one pots. Or stuff yeah. like that, you know. Literally, well, one or two pots. That's it. Yeah. And just, and then just like, I, <laughs> I was actually only having this conversation earlier. I'm brutal. From when I'm driving home, I'd be like, oh, I fancy making this thing, but I think I'm going to throw this into it. <laughs> what will that work? So you don't follow recipes. I walk into a veg shop and I'm like, hey, well, it has this, and that kind of goes with this. Sure, I'll grab a few of these, and then I'll see something else, and I'm like, ah, sure, I'll throw them in as well, and I'll see what happens. <laughs> As you'll find out from what I may, what I tell you, I make it later. Excellent. I'm looking forward to it. Um, do you have a weakness? As in, is there something you eat that you shouldn't, that you kind of treat yourself to? Sugar. You Sugar. Sugar and coffee. Really? Sugar, coffee and chocolate. Yeah. How many, how, many, how many sugars are you in a cup of coffee? Oh, two, I'd say. You're a real old-fashioned farmer. Two spoons oh, of sugar. Two. <laughs> oh, I'm, it's from the bar game. Like, from working in bars, like... You literally make a cup of tea or a cup of coffee, and that was it. Like, you sometimes, if it was like, you'd be like, Oh, it's really quiet, I'll have a cup of tea, and then literally you'd be halfway through the cup of tea or coffee, and the place would get lamped out. With yeah, it. I've and been you, there. Wouldn't, you wouldn't be able to lift your head up for like nine hours later, and that coffee with the sugar or a bit of chocolate that's the only thing that kept you going, like, because you couldn't stop and have a break. And then when you went to stop and have a break, the kitchen was closed, and you'd have to go and get like. Steve Fontaine's pizza or something afterwards. You were lucky you to know? be somewhere where there was good pizza like that. I won't tell you the kind of stuff yeah. I used to eat. Yeah, oh man, life <laughs> Or even the lads in Zaytun used to let me sit in. Oh, after. Zaytun, sober Zaytun, what was that like? <laughs> oh, I used to look, the lads used to see me coming and they'd be locking up at like four o'clock and they'd be like, come on in there. And I'd sit down and they'd be sitting down chatting and we'd just chat and I'd be there leaping and I'd be like, thanks a million lads, see you later. And they're like, brilliant. I used to love it. 
Because there'll be no pizza there, only the staff. <laughs> from the days of Zaytun and Defontaine's Pizza, say now yourself and your girlfriend are going out for a romantic meal. Where's your, where's your yeah. go-to place? I'd be a big fan of, like, I kind of like eating and chatting and stuff like that. So, like, it, and it depends on the mood, but I'd be a big fan of kind of the tapas styles. Yeah. I'd be a big fan of, like, Italian dishes where it's a mix of meat and seafood. Um then like kind of steakhouses with twists on them and stuff like that. But like, mm. I would be a big fan of tapas with somebody that I'm going out with or a group of friends, because I think it's a really good way of like having a bit of crack and trying so many different things. It's deadly. Like I love that kind of thing. And say COVID is finished. Everything is open up. Yeah. You're, bringing, you're bringing herself for a romantic special meal. Where's your, um, yeah, generally I try and find really random spots. I'm like, go down the dark ass end of somewhere and be like, oh, there's the spot, you know, or, I, or I'd actually spot it on when I'm driving around all the time. Yeah. Uh, and I'd be like, oh, I wonder what that place is like and just, you know, chance it. Yeah, I generally like kind of quieter, off the beaten track, kind of, yeah, nobody know yet kind of thing. Because, yeah, you just bump into people and they'd be like, oh, and then just like, oh, yeah, yeah. back up. <laughs> <laughs> and being a farmer, I mean, is there something that is there a dish that, that brings you back to being on the farm as a young fellow? I mean, is it beef? Is it just the classics? Yeah, just the yeah. fucking classic. Like even like bacon and cabbage. Oh man, I like when I was young, it was literally like chop up the bacon, chop up the spuds, chop up the cabbage, mix it all together, throw a big lump of uh, uh, butter on it, mix it all together, and literally just go for it. Yeah. You know. Keep and then going just, while you're working. Oh, sausage, like a breakfast, like, like even like I'd have it now when I go down on Saturday, like myself and my dad, like we finished working at like, well, we finished the morning work at like 12 and we literally had like sausage rasher, pudding, eggs, a bit of potato cake. Yeah. And then we watched a bit of them, watched a bit of uh, uh, the pedigree sale that was on. Yeah. And then we went back in and did more because we were hanging gates and fixing up water drinkers for the sheds, for the cattle for winter and stuff. So Flasks of tea full of sugar. Yeah. Oh, no, no flasks. We literally, <laughs> literally we'd walk in and out if we wanted it. That's the way we are. But we generally, once we start something, we'd stay out until we've it done and then we'd go out, you know? Yeah. And, um, and if there was something that you couldn't live without, if there was an ingredient that, that you had to have in your life that you couldn't do that, what would it be? Sugar, really? Yeah. I'd, like, even now on the road, like, I'd have four or five coffees a day. Yeah. And on the flip side of that, there's something you hate, something you want to get rid of, something that you absolutely detest. Is there anything? I don't like things when they're overdone. Like, you know the way, like, I like, you know, you'd have cinnamon rolls or cinnamon in different things and then when people put way too much or like, you know, a honeyed ham and they absolutely destroy it in honey or clove, something like that. Like, I don't (laughs) like when people go to an excess. I like things... I like things to taste what they taste of and have a balance. You know, that kind of Yeah. I can't stand when people, like, destroy something with... Like, I went and had a brunch somewhere, and I swear to God, they were, like... We were giving it a try, and they thought they were, like, they're, like... Let's just say they're hipstery. Yeah. And they they use cracked salts, let's say, sea salts. You know, big sea salt, proper sea salt. And I just got, like, eggs on toast, and I swear to... (laughs) God, <laughs> did he empty the whole like cracked sea salt across the whole thing? I was, I could taste the salt for two days. I could not drink enough water yet. And I was like, I li- and I had scraped half of it off and I could still taste it like two days later. And I was like, somebody needs to slap that lad up the back of the head and tell him, what are you doing? And I like, I know you're watching man salt, whatever, fucking, but you like, seriously, get your balance right here. Okay, I think after uh, talking about salt, I'm going to fill up my glass. I'm having a, a dingle batch one just to mark the occasion talking to Dave. So uh, we'll fill up our glasses. We might take a little bit of break and we'll be back in just a second for part two. Welcome back to the Topping Block podcast where my guest is pedigree farmer and brand ambassador Dave Cummins. So every week I ask my guests for a recipe, something they cook themselves or something they love having cooked for them. I never know in advance what they're going to give me, so this is always a little bit scary. I'll take the recipe they give me, I'll cook it, I'll share it on my Instagram story, and you can see it there. It can go good, it can go bad. We'll see what happens. So Dave, what have you got for me? I'm guessing it's a one-pot wonder. It is, kind of, yeah. It's, a, it's kind of a combination of a few different, uh, I'd say, 
style slash culture slash <laughs> um, throwing random things in. And there's a few twists on it that you can add or not add. <laughs> okay. So I would be a big fan of like different types of meat. I'd be a big fan of pasta, rice dishes, you know, stuff like that. And then again, just tasting the different flavors. Um, so mine is kind of like, it's not a carbonara. <laughs> <laughs> because if I say that, people are going to go mental. So it's actually, you see, you start off, let's say, just like a, a, a large frying pan, like a wok style frying pan, nearly. Um, you put, you have a saucepan, you get rice ready, or you have a rice cooker and get rice ready. So then you throw in your olive oil into the pan, yep. really hot. Chop up some garlic, throw it in, and just let it kind of, you know, mix with the oil. And then I chop up some chicken throw it in, chop up some um, rashers. No, no, like, none of this, like, buying the rindy bits and all this kind of crap. Go down to your butcher, ask for some <laughs> rashers. If he has some salted ones or different kind of, you know, you know, just add a bit more bite to it, brilliant. Throw it in and get, oh, get your meat kind of brown. Now, there is a twist, the Irish twist to this as well, okay. where... Because I absolutely feckin' love black pudding. So oh, I chop yeah. It. So you get your black pudding and you chop it and you chop it, you chop the circles, but you chop the circles into four and you throw that in as well. Okay. So you can chop in shallots, you can chop in whatever kind of, you know, green or, you know, onions or whatever you want. I generally go with shallots. I kind of think they give a bit more kind of nice, you know, a little bit of sweetness, but a little bit of bite to it. Okay. With the rice, if you want to as well, when you're boiling it, you can add in, like, I normally add in, like, mixed veg, kind of, like, you know, like peas, carrots, different things like that, or yeah. chopped up in with the boil. So, you brown all your meats, you know, get them to a nice color, and then you just get a thing of cream, okay? Yeah. Like, like the small little one. If it's for two, get the larger one. Yeah. <laughs> and you literally just throw that in on top. Okay. Now, I always try and get nice kind of cured bacon, like rashers, like kind of salty ones. I always find the local butcher has like really, really, um, the local one here, he has savage ones. They're absolutely brilliant for this. But if you don't have the really salty bacon, then this is where you can kind of add in your salted cheese or your salted cheese, like, you know, um, oh my God, Parmesan or something like that. Yeah. Or, some, or, or an Irish version of that, even that you can find that has that little bit of salty bite to it. So when you add in the cream, you can throw in the cheese and let it start melting as well. So you literally just want the cream to reduce by half. Yeah. By that stage, your rice should be done. And let's say if you put in mixed veg, so savory kind of rice, you literally just dump it on top. Lovely. And then you keep stirring it and stirring it. <laughs> and you literally let the rice soak up the rest of the cream. So the cream, like as the cream, when the cream was reducing, it is going to kind of go... It's going to go a brownie kind of color that's kind of scary, but it's totally fine. <laughs> so it's not going to be the prettiest dish in the world, but it might be the tastiest. No, but it actually does work. Once you put the cream, once you put the, the rice in, it, you know, it mixes in really well. And then you just keep mixing it, turn, reduce the heat down to like half the heat, and just keep stirring it around until literally the rice soaks up all the excess cream. Now, you do let the cream reduce by half before you add the rice. And... Add in at different points cheese that you want. Again, throw in some garlic halfway through, like, or when you put in the cream, just to give it a little bit of extra kick. Always season as you go along. So season your season your chicken with salt and pepper. You don't need to do anything with the bacon if you've got a good salty bacon and the black pudding. And then when, you add, when you've added in your um, cream, test it and see if it's at the right consistency. This is where you can play around with your salt and pepper or your cheese to get it to that kind of... You want it to be nice, but you want to have a little bit of a bite to it as well. Yeah. So that kind of, yeah, and then just mix in the rice and Steady. that's it. We're ready to go. Like it's, it's like one of those ones. Like when the weather turned bad, and because yeah. Danny, my miss, she's actually like, um, she's vegetarian. But she's like, will you make that? It's <laughs> <laughs> so good. It's turning the vegetarians. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, but it's just that kind of hot pot kind of. Um, it's a hot pot kind of winter thing that, you it's, know, you... It's funny, last week I made jambalaya for my guest last week, Brian. Yeah, I saw it's, that. It's yeah. quite similar, yeah. 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 Only yeah. An Irish jambalaya. Uh, yeah. What, what can I do wrong? Is there a danger I might boil the cream? 
No, I think like once you keep like I normally put in the cream and then I literally just give it a stir, let it get bubbling and then just stir it until it reduces the bit. But you still it that is probably the trickiest, the balancing act of going, oh, is there still enough cream in there to soak into the rice? Because you yeah. do want a little bit of it to soak into the rice and then just reducing the heat when you add in the rice because you just want to let it cook a little bit but not burn. But it's like, yeah. If you get the if you get the seasoning right and everything, it's just like, oh man, it's yeah. It's I look forward to it. Dave Cummins is one pot wonder, creamy black puddingy vegetarian turnany rice. Irish style jambalaya. Yeah. <laughs> that'll be fun. Okay, yeah. that'll be on my Insta story. Uh, I, I always get to this part and I'm thinking of what I'm going to do it and I have to stop and worry about the podcast. And tell me, let's test you as a beer or a brand ambassador. What would you pair with it? Saltiness. I would probably a red ale, actually. Yeah, I would probably put a red ale with it or a stout. Something crossing over. Even a red to a stout, even, even nearly like a brown ale if you had one. Well, yeah. Give me a porterhouse one to, to match with it. Irish red ale. Irish red ale. Yeah, yeah the Irish red ale or else or else the plain porter. It depends on which you prefer. It depends if you want... I love both. <laughs> both. <laughs> if you, the, red ale, the red ale in bottle is carbonated, so it will kind of cut the... Every time you have a bite, it'll kind of cut and, and kind of... Not cleanse your mouth, but refresh your palate. Yeah. Whereas the porter is just going to add to that kind of creamy, kind of you know, you know, that, yeah. yeah, dark kind of yeah flavors. You know, because it is a dry finish on the porter, so yeah, it'll probably work really well with the kind of the saltiness and that. Yeah, okay. looking forward to it. Uh, so let's come to the end. This is where you yeah. decide on your perfect meal, or if you want your death row dinner. I was trying to push the perfect meal part, but people were arguing with me, so you can have whichever you prefer. So to start off, have three courses, drink some match, but do anything you want with it. Have one course, have 10 courses. You can have anything you want. It's your meal, so it goes mad or as straightforward as you want. You could have a long table banquet with all your friends. You could have a romantic dinner for two, or you could just sit on your own with your thoughts. And have a slab of beef roasted over hot coals, or have the tastiest oh, steak imaginable. That's one thing I really want to try and do, actually. The Argentinian stuff. Thing. No, like, oh yeah, one of my mates, Augusto, he's from Argentina, he always shows me that, it's brilliant. Oh, I'd really like to do, like, smoking and slow cooking, kind of, mm. that kind of style. Just, Gee, just do it, you have so much time in your hands. Right, mm. Dave, so what's on your perfect meal, stroke, death row dinner? I definitely have to have an Irish breakfast on it. <laughs> yeah, that was shadow of a doubt. Yeah, that was shadow of a doubt. So, that'll, so be, that'll be for starters. <laughs> so an Irish breakfast is starter. So a little bit of everything. Yeah. Oh yeah. You'd have to have box tea, potato cake, <laughs> black and white pudding. You know, good nice <laughs> salty bacon. Oh, uh, everything. Yeah. yeah are, you, are you gonna have a drink with it? Yeah, I'd probably say I'd start with a whiskey with that. To be honest. With you. <laughs> 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 whiskey so, uh, for this goes really well. <laughs> what kind of whiskey are you going to have? I probably have uh, single malt bourbon sherry. Okay. Any in particular? No, not in, not in particular. Like, like, obviously, I try a dingle, but like, yeah, single bourbon and sherry, depending on what rashers and sausages you go. If you went with, <laughs> smoke, you went with smoked rashers, I'd try and have like a space side or something like that. <laughs> uh, and then as a side, which <laughs> have to be on the side just the whole I'd have to have pancakes definitely okay. you know that'd be my starter with side pancakes Crepes or American style or American style maybe-ish well let me see yeah no could be both actually feck it and then just completely <laughs> completely destroy them in syrup I mean absolutely destroy and then you can do like crispy bacon and mash it off brilliant and then you can even you know pull in the bourbon with that one does that go really well with the syrup? You know? Yeah. It'd be savage. <laughs> Brilliant. What? Breakfast for, for, for a starter. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so you've, yeah. you've cleared your plate. You're going to take yeah. a little bit of time because I imagine you've eaten a bit. Yeah. What are you going to go on to? It'd have to be some combination of meat, fish. I'd nearly have to be a tapas style. So I'd have a steak. Steak with maybe prawns or gambas or something like that. Um, maybe even like a pasta dish, like a creamy pasta dish with some fish or something as well. 
paella, you know, that kind of mix of everything in, yeah. you know, chicken or fish one. Like, it's just that kind of combination of land and sea and then cream, tomato sauce, you know, just like really, you know, yeah, rich, savage steak. Lovely. <laughs> <laughs> what are you drinking with it? I'll probably have beer with the main course. Yeah, definitely beer with the main course. Probably a few different styles, you know, just go. <laughs> You know, oh, this one goes with this, I'll have a bit of that. This one goes with this, I'll have a bit of that. But yeah, I do think like, yeah, having different things. And then just like, even like the veg and the and potatoes or different things like that, just in different ways, like in so many different ways, you can have it like your mash. Roasties, garlic, mash, chips. Yeah, had a bravas, everything, yeah. you know. Like I love, like I lived in Portugal for a while and I love just the different styles they had and mates from Sicily and went over there and just all the different because you've got that and same here in Ireland even though I think we should play on it more it's the whole land and sea kind of thing that combination together like prawns steak gambas everything you know scallops oh my god Mm -hmm. I had scallops on skewers with serrano ham and something else and I swear to god it it didn't it disappear so quick. Your man was just like, he had the plate left down and it was gone. And I was like, give me some more of that. So I think you're going to have to have a, a, a last meal with a lot of people so that you can all dip into everything. Because there's no way you can order all this stuff just for yourself. Oh, they can feck off. <laughs> they can feck off. This is all for me. Okay, so you've cleared every known bit of steak and fish and potatoes and veg and beer and you've got all that into it. And it's, You've finished what you can. There's a load of it left over because there's no way any man can eat all that. What are you going to go for for dessert? Oh, something sweet and chocolatey, definitely. It'd have to be like some kind of chocolate cake or fitter rolls or, you know, just chocolate. Chocolate. Yes. In, like if you could make chocolate lava cake, you could make brownies, you could make deep fried Mars bars. Oh my God. Like any of that kind of stuff. Savage. And so I'd literally have, I'd have two drinks with it though. Two drinks yeah. with it. I'd have a coffee. Yeah, two sugars. Yeah, I'd either or I'd have an espresso just to kind of, if I was feeling a bit tired from the main course, just to give me a bit of zest, you know, kick me over the end line, you know. <laughs> um, yeah, um, and then a cocktail, definitely a cocktail, definitely some sort of cocktail. Or actually, I could kick the espresso and use an espresso martini, and then I'd actually have just a slow whiskey drink kind of thing to finish. Or like, yeah, I'd have a vodka cocktail or or something like that, you know, something that, like something like an espresso martini or yeah. something, you know, something with a bit of kick to it, do you know, just to, and then, or even an old fashioned, no, that wouldn't go well with the chocolate. No, no I think yeah. espresso martini is the way to go. Yeah, espresso martini would probably be the one. Okay, um, and you're finishing the meal, you're going to have a long, slow whiskey, a good, good, healthy measure. Mm. Is, there, is there an extraordinary whiskey you've had or something you've never had that you would love to have as your last drink? Is that too hard a question to answer? Yeah, it's because they're unreleased. <laughs> Tell us what they are, if you can. It's, oh, a perfect, if you, it's your perfect meal. There's no limits. These are, these are available probably, to you. I would probably do, like, one of the Dingle Madeiras or one of the Dingle Amontillados. Yeah. Just that kind of combination. Especially with the chocolate and stuff like that. It just, you know, that kind of sweetness, but that kind of nuttiness, that kind of, it's kind of dry, but not, over dry it's sweet it's that nice kind of you know mm. lip smacking kind of stuff you know and is this are they you've had these have you yeah are they single malts are they pot stills are they are you allowed to have both, both? both. both. Yeah. i want you i want i want that bit of your job i don't want the, the long hours i want the, the drinking these brilliant whiskeys part <laughs> but yeah no i definitely or else i would finish with uh i'd probably finish with a single pot still port finish or port aged probably or px Mm. Yeah, yeah, maybe kind of like, yeah, like batch number three in the single malt was good, really, really good. Like I like that kind of port finish. Same with the the third release of the single pot still, you know. But um, I just think I probably would finish with a single pot still just because of the whole. It's quintessentially kind of that Irish, Irish vibe. Yeah. yeah. But Dave, that's been uh, that's been brilliant. It's the first time I I never thought I'd get to this day. On the ones I've done so far, and probably for the future, it's probably the only meal I'll ever say, I don't think I'd be able for it. <laughs> I'd be I able like to have... I like my food. <laughs> yeah, a lot. 
I, I'll tell you what, you have the food and I'll give you a hand with the, with the rest of the whiskey. Uh, so thanks a million. Thanks for sitting down with, you, with me. It's been, it's been great crack. Okay, so if you want to keep up with Dave, you can find him on Instagram and Twitter. He's at BeardyDave81. That's number 81. You can find a regular mix of beef, booze and beer and of cattle casks and cocktails on there. Uh, when COVID finally ends, I highly recommend you find one of his tastings and book in. He's as knowledgeable and as passionate as anyone I've encountered in the drinks trade. And it helps that he's extremely generous with his pours. If you want some advice, if you like your whiskey, go to Whiskey Live next year. Make sure you join the queue that's always at the Dingle stand until Dave, we sent you, he'll look after you. And if you're in Dingle, take a nice stroll out of town along the water to the distillery for a tour. It is top class. Uh, you can follow the, di the distillery on social media. They're at Dingle Distillery. And the equally brilliant Porterhouse is at Porterhouse Brew Co. Thanks to you, the listener, for staying with us to the end. If you like what you've heard, subscribe wherever you got your pods. We're, we're on all the usual providers and we're on YouTube as well. Uh, we're across all the usual social media platforms too. Just search for The Chopping Block and you'll find us. And if you know anyone who loves whiskey, beer and farming, well, send them our way. Uh, Dave's Dish, whose name that I'm not going to attempt again, is on my Insta story now. Or if you're listening later, it's on my highlights. Just look at Dave Cummins, you'll find it. If you cook it, take a picture of it, share it. Feel free to tag the chopping block and Beardy Dave in it. And we'll show it off to all our followers. So uh, that's all for me. Thanks again, Dave. No matter. Pleasure. And to all of you, farewell. Stay safe. And we will chat to you next time on The Chopping.